Okay, so I think we are ready to start. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have Joaquin Turiachi from UCSB, and he's going to talk to us about the black hole spectrum in super gravity. So thank you, Joaquin. Yeah, thank you very much for for the invitation. It's very nice to. Well, it would be better to be in person, but I guess that's as close as we can be. Um, and yes, I, I'm going to be talking about the black hole spectrum in, in super gra gravity and super gravity uh, since I guess. Well, there was a talk by, by Misha also in December about some other things we've been thinking about wormholes and some average and all that. So I will focus on this topic today. Um, yeah, so the, the, in the first part of the talk, um, so this is roughly the plan. I'm going to begin with some motivations and why the spectrum of new extremal black holes is interesting. You might think that maybe it's an old fashioned subject and we understand everything, but not, not quite. Um, and then I will emphasize what's, what are the questions that I, I, I'm interested in. And then I will look at some examples in, 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 in Einstein gravity, uh, in black holes that are in particular near extremal, but that do not preserve any supersymmetry. And then examples in supergravity where there is some, um, at the extremality, there is some, some supersymmetry that is preserved. And we will see the difference and similarities between both cases. Um, please feel free to interrupt me at any moment if you have any question or comment or complain. Also. Okay, um, so let's begin with the motivations. So I, I'm going to begin with maybe, I think hopefully it's the most familiar case for all of you, which is the charged Rice and Nordstrom black hole in asymptotically flat space. Um, by near extremal, what I mean is that we, I want the black hole with a, with a large charge. So the, the, I just want the area to be big. I want it to be macroscopic in a sense, that's all. <clears throat> um, and we also look at near extremality, which means that uh, it's a black hole at low temperatures. Or in this particular case, extremality means that the mass is bigger than the charge. Sorry, the extremality bound is that the mass is bigger than the charge and near extremality means that the mass is uh, very close to the charge. And in this region, regime, there is a large ADS2 throat in the geometry, which is this, this region here. Um, we cast uh, ADS2 crosses to approximate geometry. And somewhere here, there is a horizon that will always, it's, and this is important, it will, will always be kept as a finite distance from infinity. And this is a difference between some, well, some other results. Okay, so let me review quickly the black hole thermodynamics in this model, uh, semi-classically. Um, first, this is the bekenstein hawking entropy. And by that, I mean literally the area divided by 40 Newton uh, versus temperature. So at zero temperature, we will have a very large constant from the extremal area, this pi Q squared. This comes from the fact that the radius of the black hole is of order Q. So this is hopefully very natural. And when you go away from extremality, you have a term that is linear in temperature. Um, with this coefficient um, Q cubed. Similarly, the energy has a very large zero temperature value, which is the extremal mass, but instead of going linearly, it, be, it goes deviates quadratically with temperature from extremality. And, and these two coefficients are the same, and, and that's important. Well, the fact that they are the same, well, up to a factor of two is controlled by, by related to the fact that you have this ADS2 throat. In a way, um, but the issue I want to focus on is the gap scale of these black holes, which was introduced in, in, in this paper a very long time ago. And the idea is that while the energy um, goes to, well, the energy above extremality goes to zero quadratically with temperature, uh, the energy of, of a Hawking quanta that is emitted by the black hole is of order of the temperature. And what this means is that if you go at low enough temperature, uh, the energy of each Hawking quanta that is emitted is, can be much bigger than the energy of the black hole itself. Um, and this group interpreted this scale as a scale at which the statistical mechanical description of the black hole breaks down in a way. Um, and okay, and this, this gap scale is identified by, by demanding the energy of extremality to be the same order as the temperature. And in this case, it's always going to be given by the inverse of, of the order of the inverse of this prefactor here. So in this case, it's a very small scale, which is one over uh, the charge to the, 
third power. <clears throat> um, so that's that's the idea to try to understand this better. And this is a well a picture from from that paper, and they associate to this uh, breakdown of the statistical description of black holes some uncontrollable thermodynamic fluctuations, and we would like to understand a little better um, what they are. Okay, so to reiterate, this is the density of states rho as a function of energy above extremality. <clears throat> At very large energy, we expect this to go as semi-classical Bekenstein Hawking answer. Um, semi-classically, it will go to a constant as you go close to extremality. And this e to the s naught is the exponential of the extremal area divided by 4g Newton. Um, so we want to zoom in this region and, and see what's, what's going on here that resolves this issue that Presque and company um, identified. Um, so, okay, the reason why it's called the gap scale uh, is because there is one resolution that came from microscopic models in string theory, which is simply to say that there is no black hole in this region. region. And here you have a semi-classical behavior, but then there is something going on where the density goes to zero. There is no black hole here. And then you have this delta function at extremality with the right weight e to the s naught to account for the uh, exactly extremal states. But then, uh, okay, and I can say some more, com I will say more about this, but um, they have an argument of the, the physics behind these gaps from the string theory models, but there is not really a derivation in a sense of what the shape of this curve is, or really an understanding whether this is this dictated by string theory or by gravity itself, or what is controlling this. Spectrum. <clears throat> okay, so that's the question we want to analyze. And the answer we will get is that in the case of Einstein gravity with near extremal black holes that don't preserve any supersymmetry, um, there is actually no gap and there are quantum effects near the horizon that become large as you go close to extremality. So when you lower the temperature, this gap scale that we are not going to call a gap scale anymore after this slide. Uh, is the scale at which some mode becomes strongly coupled, and then the, the density of states, which is the green curve, deviates from the semi-classical dash curve, and it actually goes to zero um, at extremality. Now here, I, I, I say there is no gap, but of course I'm working in an approximation where I'm neglecting tiny, exponentially small gaps from the discreteness of the spectrum. Here I'm, I'm looking whether there is a gap that is bigger than that naive uh, e to the minus, order e to the minus s. Um, Joaquin? Yeah. Can I ask a question? And sure. on the previous slide, yeah. or actually on any of these slides, uh, is this supposed to be uh, in the microcanonical ensemble? Oh, yeah. So here I'm fixing, well, in the case, yeah, I'm fixing all the charges. For, exa for example, in the, in, in, in the case, this would be at fixed, uh, in the case of the range of Nordstrom, would be at fixed charge and fixed angular momentum. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Even if I, if you fix the angular velocity, this will change. It will be a little different, but, for example. Or if you fix the chemical potential, then, but within each sector, this is how the density of states looks like. Uh, so each fixed charge sector. Is this an asymptotically flat space time? Yeah. I mean, uh, if I tried to do this for a Schwarzschild black hole, this would not be well defined, right? No, I'm talking about near extremal where there's some ADS2 geometry somewhere. Um, I, I mean, as soon as you're not extremal, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the states of what theories this would be. Um, oh. Because as, as soon as I'm not exactly extremal, yeah. well, depending on whether the weak gravity conjecture is violated, even if I am extremal, but the actual ensemble is, would be dominated by by soft modes that aren't a, that have nothing to do with being a black hole. So I'm trying to understand how you're enforcing the fact that something is a black hole here. Oh, because here what we will do, I mean, maybe this will be more clear when I work out the examples, but uh, we will do the Euclidean path integral around the black hole geometry. So if you have, if for some reason that's not a good description of, of your model. So for example, I'm not going to, I'm going to assume that there are no light charged particles. 
Uh, but even I, even if they're even if even if the charge is carried by the black hole, yeah. uh, as soon as you're not extremal, um, you know the ensemble will be dominated by soft photons near infinity or whatever. I mean, it, most most of the entropy would come from states that have nothing to do with a black hole. Um. Because you have an you have an unlimited amount of entropy in such states, as soon as you have any energy at all available for them. Why is that? Sorry, I'm not. Well, you, if I give you any energy budget at all, right, you can just put it into as many particles as you as you like of of, of wavelength as long as as is needed. Mm -hmm. So so that's why they're. That's why that ensemble isn't well defined in asymptotically flat space, for example. Ah, okay. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah, actually, when I when I look at an example, I will look at asymptotically ADS4. I was mentioning the case in Ah, flat then you don't space. have that problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I should have said that. Uh, I, will, I was mentioning flat space because maybe it's the most familiar, uh, uh, I don't know, to, to show these equations in the beginning. But yeah. Okay. Um, I will do flat space for the supergravity case. For simplicity, but you could say the same as in in the case of a black hole in ADS3, for example, that is the one that appears in these string theory constructions. So, okay, some, yeah, in the case of flat space, you have to argue somehow that you're, I mean, you want to count black hole states and not something else that isn't the black hole. So that might be harder to do in practice in flat space. I agree. Yeah. Okay, thank you uh, for the question. Also, a very quick question. I mean, I'm sure this is probably going to be what you're going to explain. But uh, so if I look at your green curve, could I interpret that uh, right at extremality, you're saying that there are no density of states? Uh, yeah, so the, the density of states goes to zero as you approach extremality. Because um, I thought that the, at the extremality, I would have by construction a lot of like entropy uh, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Entropy. So that's, that's, um, that's not the case in this, in the, in the case of, of just non-supersymmetric black holes. And well, you're probably familiar with this. So this is the density of states of, of the Schwarzschild theory that is controlling the shape of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And the most, most of the argument would be to argue that that's actually a good approximation at these low temperatures. Um, yeah, the, the density of states, uh, the uh, entropy is still Bekenstein-Hawking, right? I mean, you just have a low correction or something uh, because density of states can have some you know, dressing in addition to E to the S. And if you take a log, it's a small correction. So it, you, you're not claiming that uh, the entropy is not the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, right? It's essentially E to the S Bekenstein Hawking plus, I don't know, times something, it looks like. Yes, I mean, but but that thing modifies the density of states at, at the extremality and it makes it goes to zero, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm saying that that doesn't mean that the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is is incorrect. I mean, it's it's, it's consistent, right? Uh, well, I mean, I would say it is in the sense that, or it depends what do you mean by Bekenstein Hawking. If Bekenstein Hawking, you mean literally always the area, then I would say it's incorrect because there is some quantum effect that changed the answer. But the thing that-, depends, that depends on the width, width. depending on yeah. energy width. But if energy width is like a gap, then I think it's oh. almost uh, uh, as Bekenstein Hawking, right? Because it's entropy yes. density anyway, it's always. Yes, but I mean, but you should like what what element of the Euclidean path integral tells you that you are averaging over what size of energies, right? Yeah, I, 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 I think yeah. I think okay. we're not talking about physics. Sorry, I mean, I'm just just a kind of <laughs> okay. We know, right? This curve is this curve. I think it's great. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe, I'm really maybe, sorry. Uh, okay, yes, could you just go? By now, I've lost track of the story. So, what is this an answer to? And can you just yes. say again what that plot shows? Okay. Yeah, sure. yeah, sorry, this was just like a quick summary, but I, I will go over these things more detail. But um, this is a, so there is a, a problem that was identified by, by Presky at all at, at this scale. And what this plot shows you is that the answer is not necessarily always that there is a gap, but instead there can be a modification of the density of states below this scale, and it goes to zero instead of having a gap. And uh, where here the density of states is smaller than the extremal area so would be a further one. Um, <clears throat> so, so it's just to say that the, the, the only resolution of this 
issue is not always only a gap. But as I was mentioning, we have examples of string theory where we know that there is a gap and we know that there is a large extremal degeneracy. So that's why in the last second part of the talk, we repeat this. So we, it's a reasonable question to ask, is this special of- Sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I still don't understand, even though I think Yasunari asked the same question, but yeah. what is an example where that happens? Because, and why does this not constitute a conflict with the beckinstein hawking formula? Because all, all the examples were worked out in, well, I can give you an example in ADS3 and all the examples were done with supersymmetry where you can do a calculation at weak coupling and extrapolate it to strong coupling. But no one tells you that, I mean, if, if you have an example without supersymmetry, why should you trust it? Uh, if, if you don't have any argument that allows you to extrapolate to strong coupling. So the, the calculations with supersymmetry are the ones where you do get the beckinstein hawking formula. Yeah, so in that, that what case, you're saying? That, that was this slide. So in, in the case with supersymmetry, where the black hole is near VPS in some sense, you always get the, if you do the same calculation that I'm going to describe of the previous slide, instead of the previous curve, you get this, where you have a gap with no black hole states here, and you have this delta function exactly at extremality with the right prefactor. Excellent. Yeah, I, will, I was asking about an example where you don't get the Beckinson Hawking entropy. Well, I will give you an example in ADS3. Uh, yeah. Well, I can tell you now, but I mean, I have a slide about it later. So. So you have a black hole with a certain horizon length and you find that the entropy is not given by that. Well, you can use an argument in 2D CFT of modular invariance and any 2D CFT that satisfies certain assumptions will have a spectrum of this form for uh, BTC black holes where instead of charge is the angular momentum. So you'll discuss that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Okay, uh, what, okay, I don't remember what was I said, but okay, the, the point is in, in supergravity, you have to repeat the calculation. You have some, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, okay, I guess I already said this, but yeah, to answer Hugo's questions, this is this is the, the thing that reproduced the, the answer that we expect, the stream of degeneracy. Okay, um, so this is, this is from a paper of page of 2000 that, that I like. And I wanted to show it only because, so he doesn't give an explanation, but he just analyzes the possible uh, logical resolutions of these issues. And he mentions this option one and three, that the first one is ground state highly degenerate, excited state not. And this is what happens for the supersymmetric case. And option three is what happens with the in more generic cases where all states are non-degenerate separated by exponentially tiny gaps. Of course, our analysis cannot uh, uh, distinguish these exponentially tiny gaps, but we expect them to be there if one would have access to a more detailed calculation. <clears throat> and another way to say it is that if you don't have supersymmetry, it's very unnatural to have this huge number of the general states exactly at the extremality. There is nothing to protect you. Well, okay, this is just... Uh... Okay. Um, so I will describe now the case one of a 3D rotating BTC. <clears throat> um, so, okay, I, I will look at 3D gravity and asymptotically ADS3 with the L3 will be the ADS3 radius. Um, this is the BTC metric, hopefully everyone is familiar with. It has an outer and inner horizon or plus and minus that depend on the mass E and the angular momentum J. And the extremality bound tells you that the, <clears throat> the energy is bigger or equal than, than the angular momentum. Um, yeah, so we will take the near extremal limit. As I said, we will take large J. We want the size of the horizon to be big and the temperature will go to zero. And R naught will label the, the size of the inner or outer, outer horizon, which is the difference is going to zero as a temp with the temperature. Um, in this case, the metric close to the Euclidean horizon will, be, will have an ADS2 factor with ADS2 radius L, L2. Um, here rho is, well, it's just a, um, related to the radial coordinate R in this way. It's just convenient to write it in terms of rho because maybe it's more familiar that this is ADS2. Um, and the, the Euclidean horizon is at the origin of the disk. So this is a hyperbolic disk. And this phi is the coordinate along the horizon, which is a circle of size R naught. 
And this term you can think of as a, it will be a background G1 gauge field when we reduce to ADS2 from the fact that uh, you have angular momentum. So there is some mixing between this angle and time components. Uh, so I will write ADS2 cross S1, although it's not really ADS2 cross S1 because of this term, but hopefully it doesn't cause confusion. <clears throat> and okay, so here we can do the semi-classical thermodynamics in the same way. Now E0 and S0, which are the extremal energy in our area, are given by, by these expressions where C is a central charge related to G Newton. And if you look at low temperatures, you'll have the same form as before. It will have this, this shape. And now phi r, we will call phi r this prefactor always. Um, in this case of the BTC, this phi r is given by the central charge divided by 24. That's, so the idea is that this is a, a general template for the semi-classical thermodynamics. When you have an ADS2 factor, this is well known, but this phi r will depend on, on the details of the model. And in this case, it's given by, by this formula. So the, what we what we Presque call the gap scale would be one over phi r, roughly. Uh, Okay, so the idea is that we want to do a dimensional reduction in the throat. Um, what we will do is to find the modes that dominate the temperature dependence of the partition function. Uh, in other words, the modes that became massless or that become relevant at low temperatures. And in the metric, these are three modes. One is the 2D metric in time and radius. Another one is the dilaton, which tells you the size of the horizon, which will allow to fluctuate because as you go away from the horizon, it's slowly increasing. Sorry, not the size of the horizon, but the size of the transfer space to, to ADS2. Um, and A will be a U1 gauge field. Uh, when you reduce this to 3D, uh, sorry, this 3D action to 2D in time and radial coordinate, you get this action that was derived a long time ago by Achukar and Ortiz, um, which is a dilaton gravity coupled to a U1 gauge field. Um, okay. And there are two simplifications that you can do in near extremality. Um, the first one is we will integrate out the U1 gauge field. So this is easy to do. If we look at fixed charge boundary conditions, which in this case is fixed angular momentum. Then the, the answer that you get, and this is because to the young news is so easy, is a Dilaton gravity with a shifted Dilaton potential. And the Dilaton potential will now depend, this U of phi depends on, on the angular momentum J. <clears throat> and oops, the second simplification is that um, Near the horizon, we imagine that we have a huge uh, size of this dilaton, which is the horizon, and we will look at small fluctuations around it. So phi will have some background phi knot that is constant, and we will look at small fluctuations, little phi around it. And this reduces this model of dilaton gravity to JT gravity with a linear dilaton that you can see here. And the, L, the ADS2 radius that you derive from this matches with what you get from higher dimensions from the analysis of the metric. And you have this topological term uh, that arises from the constant dilaton, which is proportional to uh, phi naught. Uh, but here I wrote in terms of S naught, which is given by, by, by this expression. <clears throat> so this is the thing that reproduces the bekenstein hawking area at extremality when, when you look at the entropy. Um, and okay, this controls the breaking of the immersion conformal symmetry in the throat because this dilaton varies and that breaks the conformal symmetry. Okay, so the answer for the gravitational path integral near extremality um, has these three terms. So the idea is that we will take the, the path integral from the asymptotically ADS3 region, which is here, and the blue line, which is the boundary of the ADS2 throat. And the path integral here in the far away region, we will assume that it's simple, that there are no quantum effects that become large at low temperature or anything. That's an assumption. And <clears throat> this is responsible for, for this term in the, in the partition function. And also is the thing that controls the boundary condition of this dilaton gravity at the boundary of the throat, the blue line. Uh, and then we use this to, 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 to glue it with the path integral at the throat itself with these boundary conditions, which is this term. And here I separated this term that comes from the topological piece that controls the, the extremal area. <clears throat> and the way to do this separation, at least semi-classically, was analyzed in, in this paper from Crivedi and collaborators. Okay, so the boundary conditions in the throat for the dilaton gravity are 
fixed dilat and fixed length, where L is the length of the time circle that controls the, the temperature, if you want to call it temperature. And this prefactor uh, happens to always be phi r. Uh, and well, now you can see we call it phi r because it's the renormalized dilaton. Uh, but this is the same factor that always appears in the semi classical thermodynamics uh, when you look close to extremality. Okay, and finally, I want to mention uh, you can ask about KK modes, um, but the contribution from KK modes or from other matter that you might have is this in a way. Uh, interactions are suppressed because everything basically gets multiplied by a large factor of phi naught, which is proportional to the extremal area. And we are taken to be large because it grows with the angular momentum. Um, and the effect of, of everything being multiplied by this huge number is that all the interactions are suppressed and you have basically towers of free fields on top of this um, ADS2 geometry. Um, also, their coupling with, with the JT mode is small, but you can check, it's suppressed by this epsilon. Um, sorry, this epsilon is the, uh, sorry, I should have said it. Epsilon is the cutoff, is related to the radial distance where we do the gluing, and epsilon is going to zero. It just means that we are doing the gluing at a region that is uh, near the boundary of ADS2. Um, and the interaction to the JT mode is suppressed by, by this parameter epsilon. So, and finally, when, when, you act, when you integrate out these this KK modes, you get something that is temperature independent and just renormalize what you mean by S not and E not. This was computed by Sen in a million ways. And for example, S not will have a, um, logarithmic corrections in, in the area. So S not to leading order is the area, but it will have log area corrections that you can match with, with well, not in this simple case, but in some examples with string theory and much that you check that you get the right answer. But okay, all, all this is to say that the JT mode is the thing that controls the temperature dependence and therefore the shape of the density of states. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so now we can solve this JT mode and integrating out the linear dilaton first. Uh, well, this was done in this paper, but uh, well, there was a reference about it. The theory reduces exactly to rigid ADS2 with the boundary mode, which is the Schwarzschild mode, which I wrote here in terms of this F of tau. And this controls the finite temperature effects and the breaking of the immersion SL2R symmetry in the throat. And this theory can be quantized exactly in a lot of, well, a lot of ways people have done it. Uh, but this is the answer that you get. So from the perspective of Stanford and Witten, they would say that this is one loop exact for well, reasons that are not important right now. And this exponential is the semi-classical, uh, controls the semi-classical behavior of the, of the thermodynamics. And you have this term, which is a one loop exact that um, gives a log T correction to, to the free energy that will be responsible for this shape that I showed before. Um, yeah. Okay, so can we do a check at least to make sure since 3D gravity is simple that we're not doing something completely wrong. Um, something nice about ADS3 gravity is that we can look at pure ADS3 gravity around the BTC geometry. And the path integral was computed exactly by Maloney and Witten, including, and here I'm talking about only perturbed, uh, the path integral over fluctuations around the BTC geometry. Um, and then the answer is a product of vacuum characters as a function of, of the modular parameters of the boundary torus. So this tau and tau bar are related to, to the fixed temperature and fixed angular velocity of the black hole. Um, and this is what it is. So you can take the near extremal limit, take large, first go from large, uh, sorry, go from fixed angular velocity to fixed angular momentum and take a large j small t limit. And you will get exactly this, which matches with the JT, with, with the previous expectation. Um, we we'll get this A to the S naught, minus beta E naught, uh, the classical Schwarzschild, and this one loop correction from, from gravitons in ADS3 also matches with the one loop from the temperature dependence of the Schwarzschild mode. Um, okay. So the near extremal spectrum of this black hole uh, if you inverse Laplace transform, the previous answer is given by this famous Sincher square root T. You might have seen a bunch of times. Um, 
if you look, go to large energies, this will go exponentially with square root e, and this is the bekenstein cocking behavior. Like, this is the semi-classical area over 40 Newton behavior. But if you go to arbitrarily close to extremality, then this density of states will go to zero as a square root. Um, and the thing we try to argue is that uh, this, this is accurate at energy scales that are of the same order of one over phi r. Um, so, okay, ac according to Presky et al, uh, the statistical mechanical description was supposed to break down at this scale, but we find that um, the resolution is that there is this quantum effects that deviates strongly from the semi-classical answer and there is no gap. Uh, so this is very counterintuitive, I think, that you have this huge black hole, but when you lower the temperature, there is some mode that becomes strongly coupled. That's uh, very funny. Hey, uh, can yes. I? Yeah, I, I probably make one comment and one yes, uh, sure. question. And what I wanted to say, or at least I thought I said, was that if you look at this expansion for rho, yeah. and it is near E equal E0, you can expand the cinch as just the linear, so it's a square root e minus e zero times e to the s zero, right? Yeah. And and then if you take a log, then it's essentially become s zero Bekenstein Hawking mm -hmm. plus one half or whatever, one half log e minus e zero. Yeah. So that means that unless e is exponentially close to e zero, yeah. Where uh, anyway uh, the concept of density of states and uh, you know density yeah. of entropy it breaks down anyway unless that's the case it's Bekenstein Hawking entropy, so that's why uh, Bekenstein Hawking entropy is not wrong, <laughs> and of course you, you did more than that, but uh, 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 Bekenstein Hawking entropy kind of uh, precision is not high enough to your level that yeah, but, but uh, mean, Bekenstein but, Hawking entropy is correct. But uh, I guess what, what the way I would phrase it is that we never expected the Bekenstein Hawking entropy to be correct always anyways like the thing that I, I think we have most evidence that is correct is to you do the euclidean path integral and you get what you get uh, and in this case what you get is something that deviates from the area in a non-intuitive way because the black hole is too big but, uh, but but i but but related to what you said first i agree that you cannot trust this all the way down to zero because yeah. if the temperature is low enough and, and this is um, I cannot do it in higher dimensions, but in the case of 2D gravity, you can sum over these wormholes that will give you some discreteness. After yeah. You have over theories and, and then, so, so this is supposed to, to be valid for energies that at least are much bigger than e to the minus S. Yes, that's, is yeah. that right, right? So that's, what, that's why that uh, this correction in, if you're after taking log, yeah. is a sub-leading compared with the S Bekenstein hooking. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So in that sense, uh, the, the entropy still is against the Hawking, but you could do uh, more than that. Well, but if you if you ask what is how many exactly extremal states do you have in your theory, the answer could be none, could be one. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's not something that is that you can predict from gravity. What yeah, exactly? But I'm exactly saying, because the Hawking uh, or oh, entropy density concept is like a coarse grained. No, no, so, that's, uh, that's, that's, that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's it, that it's correct in that sense, and then uh, your calculation is even more finer, uh, a more precise uh, calculation. Than yeah, I guess what I, was, what I would call Bekenstein Hawking would be to to put an exponential here exactly. Yeah. I would say that that's Bekenstein Hawking. So this is yeah. different in that sense, but if you average over some window of states, you will get that it's always further e to the s not. Yeah, uh, is, are we supposed yeah. to be surprised about how big of a window we have to average over to, to coarse grain? No. Is that supposed to be what's special about this setting? No. Uh, yeah. Maybe, well, no, yeah. because this cinch is essentially linear term. So let's take a log S0 yeah. plus log E minus E0. So unless E is exponentially close to E0, it's just S0. Mm -hmm. And then if E is exponentially close to E0, things break down. I mean, E to the minus S, right? Yeah. Yeah, what I'm saying is that just if you look at some coarse grain if you average over a small window of energies and you define a notion of a density of states here, for example, you will get a number that is different from E to the area. So in that sense, it deviates from Bekenstein Hawking. Yeah, because but it's a sub-reading. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's okay. a sub-reading. Uh, 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 yeah. So, uh, um, so Yasunori, are you yeah. saying that if you if, if you plotted the log of rho instead, then it would look much That's more entity, sharp? Right. Like, S zero is a Bekenstein yeah. number. Yeah. E to the S zero. This is E to the S zero times square root E minus E zero. And I understand the formula. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you take a log, that's the entropy is S zero 
plus one half log e minus e zero. So yeah. unless e is exponentially close to e zero, this log piece is totally negligible. Well, yeah. I'm trying to understand why the green curve doesn't look like that, but no, it looks like I mean because uh, in in, in it, before taking log, it's just this yeah. this envelope so envelope of e, yeah. e minus e zero is really like cutting off. That's right. It 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 goes with the log phi r e. So this is order one if the energy is of order one over phi r. But but okay. Yeah. So that, that that's all I wanted to say. And the other okay. question is that in order to go into this uh, calculation. You really took just a giraton, right? And then you just did the jetty. So does that mean that uh, this entropy is mostly carried by just simply like how the area is quantized in the S-way way? I mean, it, it doesn't matter in yeah. higher dimension, mm -hmm. it's angular direction. That's very interesting because that's not the case for, uh, I think it's usual shows here. It's like, that's like yeah. a soft- No, this, yeah, this is definitely special about the near extrema limit and that's yeah. why we, so in a sense, that's what, what I was arguing, that if you look at the KK modes, they don't affect the temperature of the planet. Yeah. So it's controlled by this. Very interesting. Very interesting. That's, that's, that's yeah. very special to, 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 to this case. But, yeah, but yeah. Am, I, am, I, am I understanding correct? That this yeah, is just yeah, yeah, some kind of area. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Um, well, you also need to include this. I, I, I skipped it because I, I'm looking at fixed charge. And also, you have also fluctuations of the U1 gauge field from the reduction. It's like you have this gravity mode coupled to a gauge mode from rotations. That's really great because it's sort of one of my confusion I had before. Oh, okay. so anyway, it was great. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, can I ask one more thing about the plot? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what did you choose for S0 in this plot? It was some number of order one, right? S0? Oh, yeah. oh this, is, this is just made with keynote. I, I didn't follow any. I know, but if we, if, if we assigned an S0 to this plot, I think it would be yeah. about one. It's not I think that's what makes that make the because because you can see right that the the e phi I mean the, the density of states doubles on a scale that's that's about one over phi for for the energy. Well, I wasn't. So that, I, wasn't I think that, I think that implies. Yeah. No, I'm trying to understand why the plot looks so dramatic, and I think the reason it looks so dramatic is that you chose the entropy of the black hole to be about one to start with. That would be true regardless of what S naught was. S S naught is just a rescaling of rho. Yeah. No, no, but if you yeah, row row is s naught plus the square root of no, it's s naught. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, right. Row is s naught right. time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it looks dramatic yeah. just because it's yeah, just logs hide all sorts of stuff. Like it is dramatic. Logs hide all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, but s naught has to be large for this approximation to make sense in any ways. No, that, that's true. But yeah. you're right that. It has nothing to do with how you plotted it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yes. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. Let me mention briefly that uh, here the well, this is was understood with after all the recent advances of SYK and all that. But the fact that the fact that you break conformal symmetry is important. If the conformal symmetry of ADS two would be broken, then you would expect this density of states. Oops. Um, that's the only thing that makes sense. If conformal symmetry is exact, but of course to get this exponential that connects with the semi-classical answer, you need to include a dimensionful something dimensionful that breaks the conformal invariance. So that's that's broken, and you get this this spectrum. And as you go closer to extremality, this mode that breaks the conformal invariant becomes more important. Doesn't go away. Okay, so yeah, so we. I argue that there is some universal gravitational sector in ADS3 when you look at near extreme states. And so a reasonable question is, is there a universal sector in 2D CFT described by this JP mode? And that would be interesting to 2D CFTs and also would be a kind of another derivation of this behavior. And the answer is yes. And we studied this in this paper with, with Animic Gosh and Henry Maxfield. And the idea is that if you assume that your 2D CFT has a twist gap, this is the usual, um, just an assumption that, that doesn't have any large number of conserved currents of higher spin or something like that. Uh, you assume that it has large C and you assume modular invariance. Then uh, this density of states that I wrote down from, from JT is a good approximation for, for the density of states of, of, of these 2D CFTs. 
And the idea is that you can do the calculation in, at fixed angular velocity and temperature, or equivalently left and right moving temperatures, which I wrote here as a function of j and beta. And then modular invariance tells you that in this limit, plus the twist cap assumption, the partition function is dominated by a vacuum character in a dual uh, channel. Okay, this is a little technical, but then once you get here, the calculation is the same as in pure gravity, and you get this cinch. So this is, a, in a sense, an extended Cardi limit. So the Cardi limit will only see the exponential. But when you have a twist gap, um, you can look at this regime of, of, of left and right moving temperatures. Uh, you, you, can, you can argue that this is a good approximation all the way down to extremality. Well, as long as the temperature is bigger than. Uh, Interesting. No, no large torque coupling required, no holography. No, well, you need a twist gap and large C, so you could ask. Yeah, that C is needed, clearly. But, uh, well, I, it, I don't know if it's that. I don't know any theory, <laughs> because like, I guess with the only thing we know is our minimal models and things like that. Um, uh, uh. So yes, but presumably, well, the, the models that are dual to the D1, D5, for example, but that's the case that I will talk next, because that one also has supersymmetry, would fall in this category. and. So those models, models should have uh, this immersion JT mode in, in, in when you evaluate it at, at these states. Mm -hmm. So there is, and, and this is very universal. I mean, this is regardless, you, you could imagine that you have some matter in ADS3 or whatever, as long as you have some twist gap, meaning well, twist in the gap, and large C, then this Schwarzschild's density of states would be accurate. And I'm not going to talk about it, but you can make similar comments about correlators. So not only the spectrum, but also the dynamics is controlled uh, by this mode, um, including these quantum effects that happen when you go below the gap scale, not only the semi-classic. The semi-classical answers are easy to get, but the quantum corrections are harder to match. Um, okay. Now I have some comments that I guess I will skip because this took longer than I thought. Uh, but okay, one can make some comments about pure gravity in 3D. But let me move on to Einstein gravity in 4D, in asymptotically ADS4. And here I will go a little faster because the idea is very similar. What I just did did not depend that much on having 3D or 4D. So we'll look at Einstein Maxwell, you have a, uh, Einstein term, we have a cosmological constant of ADS radius L. Um, this is the Rice and Nordstrom black hole in 4D for an electrically charged black hole with a chemical potential nu related to the charge Q. And at the extremality, we'll call the horizon size RH. And it's easier to consider a large black hole in ADS where well, one can make some approximations. And here the gap scale is extracted again from from this thermodynamic behavior near extremality and it's related to the ADS4 radius and the size of the horizon in this way. Um, well, so this is the picture of how the geometry looks like. We have the faraway region that goes, that is, is glued into ADS4 that we can treat classically. And then we have the throw that we treat quantum mechanically uh, in the near, near horizon region. Um, we have an ADS2 with an ADS2 radius that is related to ADS4 radius. Um, if you had a black hole in, in flat space, then this L2 would be a further Q, but if you have it in ADS4, it's a little different. And, and an S2 with, with size R0. Um, and we do the matching at some radial distance RC, which is very large compared to the ADS2 radius. So here, everything works the same way, but instead of having a U1 gauge field, you have an SO3 gauge field from the symmetries of S2. So you have your ADS2, met, well, your 2D metric in radial and time coordinates. You have your dilaton with the size of the horizon. And then you have these fluctuations of the sphere. So the sphere is parameterized by Y, and H is the metric of the sphere, which uh, become massless if the low temperature limit. Um, and then you also have the S wave reduction of the gauge fields. And the 4D action becomes a dilaton gravity coupled to a SO3 gauge field. So this is the field strength and then it's at the U1 gauge field. But now you can do the same simplification. So um, you can look at sectors of fixed charge, or in this case, I did the opposite. I did fixed chemical potentials. 
Um, and then, anyways, it will be a, the answer will be given as a sum over charge, fixed charge sectors. And each of them is computed by some Dirac gravity with some Dirac potential that depends on, on the charges, which in this case are Q and J, J being the angular momentum. And the next step is to do the linear Dirac approximation, which again reduce the theory to JT gravity in the same way as before. And from do, looking at the gluing with asymptotically ADS4 region, you extract the boundary conditions. So this is this all works the same way. Uh, okay, so there are similar comments about the correction. So heavy charge matter and KK modes, they all produce corrections that are temperature independent. To reiterate, for example, there is a correction in S0 proportional to log L2, which in, if you were in flat phase, this L2 would be Q and this would be a log Q correction or log area. Interactions are suppressed in large uh, because uh, in R0 and also in Epsilon, where Epsilon is the cutoff in ADS2. Well, and all the same things I said before, but there is one thing we, we didn't do, which is to incorporate light charge matter that can, that can decay. And that's something interesting that we didn't do. Presumably it's not that difficult. Oops. Okay. Okay, so basically we can uh, take the same template as before for the density of states at fixed charge and angular momentum and the same conclusion applies. Um, maybe I will skip this, but you can also see what happens when you fix chemical potential and allow the charge to fluctuate. There are some interesting things. Okay, so the conclusion is, well, the picture that I draw in the beginning. So this, we expect this near extremal black holes to, to have this shape for the, the spectrum. And this phi r now is the scale at which this mode that breaks the conformal symmetry becomes strongly coupled and not, not a gap. Okay, so in the last 10 minutes, I guess, I will go over the supergravity case to see the differences and see that this is not inconsistent with the string theory expectations. Um, so for supergravity, okay, I guess I'll have to go over it a little quickly, but um, we look at 4D n equals two supergravity in flat space, just because it's simpler. Um, and, and here you might say your, well, the complaints that Rafael was saying, but Okay, that's the just technically the simplest case to analyze. Um, so the field will be in the gravity sector will be a metric, a gravitino, two gravitinos and a U gauge field. And this is the action. These are the supersymmetry transformations. And in this theory, the riser north from black hole is a solution. And maybe it's not the one that dominates, but uh, okay, we'll ignore that issue for now. Um, so this is a picture about what's going on with the supersymmetry of the solution. <clears throat> so if you look far away, you have flat space. This preserves eight supercharges because we have n equals two. You have four and four. Near the horizon, you have this ADS2 process two geometry that also preserves eight supercharges, but the, the geometry in between, interpolating between both of them, breaks four of them and preserves only four supercharges. And this is analogous to the fact that, so it will be interested in the effects that, that of the breaking of this supersymmetry in the same way that we break the SL2R. Um, the super conformal group that is emergent in the throat instead of being SL2R is PSU112. It has two bosonic components. One is the SL2R of before and the SU2. These are the rotations of the sphere. And then we have four, uh, sorry, eight supercharges, uh, four of which will be broken. Uh, and the near spectrum, the near extremal spectrum comes from, from, from the fact that you have this pattern of symmetry breaking. Okay, so the immersion and broken explicitly symmetry in the throat is PSU112. And the way that this affects the calculation is that there are new fermionic modes from the gravitino that become relevant in the throat when you reduce. And you need to also take into account to look at the uh, temperature dependence of the partition function in extremality. And this was analyzed to linear order in, in, in this paper by Michelson and Spradlin in 99. And in this paper with, with Heidemann, Luca Iliesu, and, and Wen Li Xiao uh, from last year, we did the reduction of, of uh, this theory of n equals 2 gravity to, to, to D, and we get an n equals 4 supersymmetric generalization of JT. 
And here, the reason why you get n equals four is because of what I said. We, we want the theory that preserves the symmetries that are actually exactly preserved by the black hole and not only, well, not the eight ones that are fake in a way, or that are broken. Um, this theory of supersymmetric JT gravity is, you can think of it as a BF theory of PSU 112. Um, so here phi is related to the dilaton and F to the, so this is in the first order formalism. So some components of the PSU 112 become the metric, other ones become the SU2 gauge field, etc. Um, but maybe I should go over this faster. But yeah, so you can look at the, at the boundary conditions in the throat in the same way as before. Uh, from the perspective of BF theory, there are mixed boundary conditions. So you fix this combination of A and phi. And when you are careful about the boundary terms, you will, you will see that the theory reduces to a, a pure boundary mode, which we can show that is equivalent to a n equals four generalization of the Schwarzschild theory. Um, yeah. okay, I'm not giving too much details, but hopefully you get an idea. This is very much analogous to the bosonic case. Um, okay. So before I mention this Schwarzschild theory, uh, let me introduce super parametrizations. So first we define the super line to have a bosonic coordinate tau. This will be Euclidean time. And it has four fermions that are organized in a doublet and anti -doub or fundamental and anti-fundamental of the SU2. Um, and well, these are the super covariant derivatives. Um, and super reparametrizations are, uh, well, defined in this way, very naturally. Uh, but the important thing is that they have to satisfy this four set of constraints um, to be good super reparametrizations. And this was studied in these papers from, from the 80s. But it's standard, even if you had n equals one or n equals two, you still have to impose some constraints. Uh, I'm not going to write the most general solution, but the important thing is that the most general solution of those constraints is given by four functions. One is a bosonic f of tau reparametrization. The second is a g of tau, um, uh, which is an element of SU2. So it's like a local SU2 transformation. And then you have these eight fermionic um, degrees of freedom. So any solution of, of a super parametrization can be labeled by these fields. And here I write the case of PSU 112 as an example, but okay, this is just an example. So you see that this SU2 transformation basically rotate uh, these fermionic coordinates. And the bosonic one acts in the usual way of SU2R. Uh, okay. okay, but the only important thing for now is that once you define this n equals four super parametrization, you can define an n equals four Schwarzschild, which is the key. This um, this is written in superspace, um, but once you write it in superspace, you can identify which bosonic coordinate you want to call the action of your Schwarzschild theory. Um, so I'm not going to go through the details, but in, in this paper we identified which one. There is one which is the one that you get from the 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 reduction from super JT. So that tells you what the boundary mode is. And this SB is one component of this super. And one way to check it is that if you expand it in, in bosonic, um, if you expand this explicitly, you get the, the bosonic Schwarzschild mode and you get the particle moving on SU2, which is what you should get. And then you get fermions that I'm not writing now. Um, so the summary of the steps is that we start with this 4dn equals two supergravity. We fix the u1 charge. Everything that I'm doing now is at fix u1 charge q. We look at the throat. We reduce it to n equals four super jt, which is with, which we can show is the same as a PSU 112 BF theory. And then we integrate out the dilaton and reduce this BF theory to a 1d boundary mode, which is this n equals four super Schwarzschild. And from here we extract the spectrum as a function of energy and spin. And that's what we will do in the last couple of minutes. Um, so what you need to do is to do the path integral over this mode. That's equivalent to this. That controls the temperature dependence that is introduced by this super JT mode. And it has two parameters. One is the inverse temperature beta, 
and they appear in the boundary conditions. And the other one is this parameter we call alpha, which is the SU2 chemical potential, and it's related to the angular velocity in this way. So if, if at infinity you fix the angular velocity to be omega, then it means that you should turn on alpha in the throat to have this particular value. Uh, but just happens to be simpler to the calculation this way, but then we can expand in modes and extract the density of states at fixed angular momentum instead, which is more uh, transparent. But okay, so this is the answer um, for the partition function as a function of temperature and chemical potential. You can do it with localization or with, well, with canonical methods that we introduced in this paper, but you can pick whatever you prefer. Um, and the answer is a sum over saddles in the same way with a classical action and one loop determinants from the Schwarzschild, SU2 mode, and the fermions. And this is, can also be obtained as a limit of an N equals four Vira solo character that was derived by Eguchi and Taormina. And this, the, the fact that this is a limit of a character automatically implies that this will also be a good approximation of black holes in ADS3 in the same way as I explained in the bosonic case. Uh, so, so that makes this easier. But okay, so um, now the last step after finding the partition function will be to extract the spectrum. So we need to do some inverse Laplace transform. But as you can see here, this is kind of a mess. Well, first, we would like to know what do we want to expand in and also how are we going to do it? Um, so this is the way you should expect to, to expand this ugly function that I just showed you. Um, first of all, you should expand the, dens the dependence on the chemical potential in SU2 characters, which are these objects here. <coughs> um, they are defined by, by this expression. Uh, and, and they come from summing over states with different J3, but with the same, in the same representation of SU2. It's very natural. Uh, and then you should integrate over energies. This is part of the continuum with some density of states, rho at fixed J and E. And you should also include extremal states that are at exactly equal zero. And now, finally, you might have noticed that here I put a particular combination of angular momentum that they all come together here and here. And this comes from analyzing the supermultiplex, uh, the structure of the supermultiplex under the unbroken supersymmetry. So there is part of the supersymmetry that is unbroken. And that's the thing that controls this organization in uh, spins. So the states with energy equals zero, the supermultiplex has only one state of spin J, that's all, and this is this term. Uh, but when the energy is not zero, uh, and these are, the, sorry, these are like the BPS states. And when the energy is non-zero, then the states come in, in general come with a component of spin J, J minus one half, and J minus one, and that's what you see here, uh, except for the one with, well, for this one that is a little shorter with the one half and zero. So that's why I wrote it separately, but other than that, they are uh, analogous. So this density of state should be interpreted as a density of super multiplets labeled by the highest angular momentum J. Um, Okay, so then what we need to do is to take this, this function I wrote before and expand it and extract this continuum density of states as a function of energy and angular momentum and the extremal or VPS or zero energy uh, uh, contributions. Okay, and that surprisingly happens to be not that complicated uh, or at least the answer is mm, looks not too bad and surprisingly similar to the bosonic case even though it's a completely different calculation. Uh, first of all, you see that the extreme states at zero energy come only from states with angular momentum equals zero. Um, and this is this delta function that I draw here. And they come with a prefactor of e to the s naught. So these are the states that were counted by Strominger and Buffa or whatever, for example, or whatever example you prefer to from strict theory. Um, and, and the fact that they come only with spin equals zero makes sense because you cannot construct black holes that preserve supersymmetry with charge and angular momentum. Or at least you cannot do it in flat space. You can do it in ADS4 or ADS5 um, or ADS3, but, but not, not in flat space. 
So the only VPS states is J equals zero. And that also implies that that's the only one that contributes to the index. So it also explains why the index is the same as the degeneracy. Um, but okay, but then you have a continuum of states labeled by the super multiples J. And they come only also with a cinch, but now the gap of each super multiplet depends on the angular momentum in, in, in this way. So each super multiplet with highest angular momentum state J will start at this energy. Um, and it looks very similar to the bosonic case, except for this one over E squared. Other than that, it's the same. Um, so this is the density of states in the left panel of super multiplets. So the, the, the zero one has only these states and the one half one, the one half supersymmetry starts at E gap, which will be one over eight phi R. You just put J equals one half. So we derive analytically a formula for the gap and, and not just the argument of Preskill and, and, and collaborators was order of magnitude. So this gives you an actual value of the gap. And, and this curve is what you get from this cinch. Um, then in the right hand side, um, uh, what I draw is the density of states of, uh, for each angular momentum, not super multiplet. So here I write all the states with, oh, I should have wrote written, but with j equals zero. Um, and then what you have is that you have this contribution from the extrema state. And then you have this contribution coming from the one half super multiplet. If you remember, it has a component uh, of spin zero. And then you have another component from the super multiplet one because it also has spin zero. And then all the higher super multiplets do not have spin zero component anymore. So that's why they don't contribute. Uh, so I, I don't know, I find it surprising that you do a one loop calculation in gravity and you, you get something that resembles some discreteness, at least in the spectrum with this empty region between extremality and a gap. Okay, so this is a summary of the difference between gravity and supergravity. So uh, the dashed line again is the semi-classical answer, literally computing into the area. And, and this is the what we what we get. Um, I will skip it. We already talked about it a lot. And then finally, okay, I will skip this because I'm out of time. But let me just mention that you can extend this to ADS three. Um, uh, and well, in ADS three, the theory of gravity said the um, churn Simons. You can describe it as a churn Simons PSU one one two cross PSU one one two theory at level k. Level the level k is related to the Newton constant. But okay, and the Newton constant. Well, sorry, I'm trying to decide what to say because it's kind of out of time. But um, you can take like a few more minutes, okay? Especially because we asked you. A lot of questions. Okay. So yeah, yeah, you can breathe and say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, um, yeah. Okay. So okay, I would try to say it fast anyway. So the ADS three case that we're interested in is four comma four supergravity, which is described by a Chern Simons action with supergroup PSU one one two cross one one two left and right movers lever K, and the level comes from the fact that there is a, a SU two gauge theory inside which has a churn Simons, which has level K. Um, and the charges JL and JR, from the ADS3 perspective, they are charges, but usually in string theory, there is some S3 coming from higher dimensions, and these are angular momentum in, in this higher dimension as well. So we're gonna look at extreme VP, near VPS states with some momentum P, where here the momentum is along the ADS3 coordinate, uh, is what I called J before, but I don't want to confuse it with the SU2 charges. Um, we can look at the black hole that rotates with some uh, JL uh, non-zero, but JR equals zero. So you, you want the rotation to be chiral. Like everything happening in the left movers with all the right movers turned off, then that will be super symmetric. Um, you can compute S0 and phi R. Um, if you remember phi R is equal to C over 24, um, oh, sorry, maybe I should say, uh, other than the supersymmetry, the black hole looks just like BTC with some gauge field turned on. And this phi R is C over 24. But in this case of supergravity, the central charge is related to the level of the Chern Simons theory K, and, and it's given by this formula, it's K over four. 
And if you plug this into the preview spectrum, you'll get that the gap is one over 2K. Uh, so now it's basically the same picture as before, but just what you, you need to change the labels a little bit. And what we call the charge before now is the, the momentum P and what? And what, what I call the angular momentum before now is the right moving angular momentum. So if my BPS state has everything left moving, then I turn on the right mover a little bit and I go away from uh, supersymmetric from BPS. Uh, Can I ask you kind of uh, yeah. like how to think about this? Um, in without the BPS condition, yeah. uh, we expect that. Uh, uh, exact this energy will be lifted, right? Because you can have some tiny perturbation and you found, in fact, in bosonic case, there is no exact degeneracy. But in BPS with the supersymmetry, of course, clearly you can have a really degenerate like a flat direction in a, in a potential. So you found that. And to understand the gap, we need yes. to include uh, uh, angular momentum J equal one, then it's no longer BPS. So there is no reason that the threshold to be staying in exactly the same location as j equals zero, therefore it will shift. Yes. So this shift of, of the of the threshold by by you know loop effect and so on is what's causing this gap. Is that no. almost the right right kind of understanding? Well, almost, but the the, com the nice thing is that so here right you have this this part, but this part is all spin zero. So yeah, so these are comp all components with spin zero. So. I mean, they have a gap because they are part of a super multiplet with a higher spin. Yeah. Uh, but because it's not protected, right? It's not protected. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But 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 what I mean is that it, it wasn't obvious before we did the calculation that oh, the yeah, spin course, course, component course. would not have would have a gap like this. But yeah, if, you yeah. at, if you look at non-zero angular momentum, then uh, then the spectrum looks like this, like what I draw here. Mm -hmm. So it starts at some higher energy, like you were saying. And other than these little kinks coming from all the super multiples that contribute at each angular momentum, other than that, it looks exactly like the bosonic case. And that's fine because they don't preserve any supersymmetry yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. yes. Thank so you, you can see that. Uh, you can see that. Yeah, of course, calculation is needed. I mean, I'm not saying yeah. that no, <laughs> no, we no. can understand without cal we yeah. after calculation how to interpret. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, I just wanted to yeah, make yeah. sure that I'm, I'm right. Yeah. No, okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, yeah, and the last comment is that, uh, so you can look at the D1, D5 system that Strominger and Buffa used to first calculate the number of extremal black holes. And in this case, the, the level K is the product of the number of D1 brain and D5 brains. And you can compute the gap of this, the size of the gap from the analysis I just said, and it's given by this answer. Um, and this is the, the gap that Maldacen and Saskin predicted from the long strings in the 90s. And well, let me just say that actually, I mean, this value is actually fixed by 2D Virasoro algebra because there is some ADS3 so pro. But the but the, the what I try to emphasize, or the reason why I try to focus on 4D is that this the size of the gap is actually not, it's more universal than this example, this particular example with ADS3. Like this one happens to be controlled with by Virasoro symmetry, but even in cases where you don't have a Virasoro symmetry in your theory, this should also uh, hold the Schwarzschild limit. In a sense, that this Schwarzschild limit is more universal than than, than this, than the um, than, well, than Virasoro, of course. Okay, so that's all. So what I was trying to to do is to explain how to carefully separate the extremal physics of black holes. From the near extremal physics controlled by this JT mode. Um, uh, well, maybe I will finish here. I guess I already went over time too much, but I will just leave the comments. Yeah, thank you very much. That's been working. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we can ask you maybe a few questions. So, mm -hmm. anybody? Mm -hmm. If not, I have a, a quick question first, Joaquin. So whenever you're talking about your 4G uh, example before, so it was before you were talking about the supergravity examples, yeah. uh, you, you used an electric black hole, but like is in principle also, could I use sort of like 
because for BTZ, you use the rotating BTZ to go near extremo and do an expansion on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, can you imagine that similar story could be told in higher dimensions for rotating black holes? It's just that it's technically a little harder. Is that the yeah? The it's you mean like curved black hole or something like that? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, the problem with curved black hole is that it's harder to justify what are these massless modes that control the behavior near extremality. Like you, you can do it classically, and that was mm -hmm. done papers by Trivedi and company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like on shell, like there's some modes that when you compute the action, it gives you the same as the, the if you do it from an ADS2 perspective or, or 4D perspective. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of to argue off shell that this will give you the temperature dependence. In, yeah, it's just because the, the near horizon metric of Horowitz and like Bardeen is kind of very complicated. So, so like even because I feel that again, maybe my intuition is wrong, but like in the 3G example that you gave, sort yeah. of like the rotating direction, you you make it simpler because it becomes just a gauge field, and then you just put boundary yeah. condition. Yeah, yeah. So you, you can do it in curve. It's just that it's harder to do the dimensional reduction off shell. You know. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. It's more like. But you can go to 5D because then you have the the angle. The, instead of S2, it's an S3. The horizon. Mm -hmm. uh, and then S3 is, well, for some reasons, it's simpler. Mm -hmm. Like rotating mm -hmm. black hole in 5D is simpler than in 4D. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but in 4D is complicated. But I even, see. I mean, even classically, like there was a lot of papers by Strominger and company. There are some things even classically that are very hard to do in curve mm -hmm. that you can do once you realize that you can separate the throat from the outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. I see. But, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So any other questions? I mean, also we'll chat with you tomorrow and I'll have a little bit more, but I'll, yeah, I'll bother you tomorrow. Yeah, that's fine. Good. So yeah, if we have no more questions, let's thank Joaquin again. So thank you, Joaquin. Thank you. Yeah, beautiful results. Thanks. Thank you.